Hey, this is Mark, and we're continuing in our series on uh, systematic theology, renewing our mind through the truth. And I wanted to say from the outset that those of you who have uh, in college perhaps studied religion, I think it's important that we make a distinction between religion and theology. Several decades ago, a, um, there was a subtle but profound change in um, academic circles because for the most part, particularly in Christian colleges, you had departments of theology. But now they're called the Department of Religion. And that's um, may just sound like quibbling over words, but it's not. Because religion is a study of human behavior. It's usually assumed under anthropology or um, sociology and but theology is the study of God the science of the study of God and at one point theology was known as the queen of the sciences and all the other disciplines were like her handmaid um, but that uh, has definitely changed so okay we our first topic that we looked at was what it meant it means to say that God is Lord. Then we looked at how the Lord interacts with us, and that's through the covenants. Tonight we want to ask how the Lord communicates with us, and that is through the Word of God. And, uh, boy, this is a um, profound and um, pretty comprehensive topic, and we're going to spend um, well, at least more than one time on it. Because there's, we'll have to deal with things like the attributes of Scripture, like its sufficiency and clarity and so forth. But tonight, I just want to introduce um, the, the 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 Word of God, and so we'll just begin by uh, asking, what is the Word of God? And it's not just the Bible. Uh, when we ask what is the Word of God, we can talk about the Word of God in nature, or what it, theologians refer to as general revelation. We can talk about Jesus as the Word of God. We can talk about the words of God in the inter-Trinitarian communication. For backwards eternity, before there was any creation at all, the Trinity, in their own language, whatever that is, communicated with himself. And of that definitely is the Word of God. Um, and then we have what we normally think of when we talk about the Word of God, and that's the um, inscripturated Word, and which is the Bible. You have the incarnate Word, and you have the inscripturated Word. And when we read the inscripturated Word, we meet the incarnate Word. As we'll see, the two go hand in hand. And God cannot abandon his lordship attributes when he communicates with us. So that will be the model that we use in talking about God's communication. It is, um, but in essence, the word of God is person-to-person -person communication. Capital P, person, to little p persons, us. God in his tri-personality um, as a trinity is communicating. It's very much like persons to persons. As we communicate, God is absolute, infinite, holy, and distinct from us, but he is never less personal, and we're made in his image. And thus he has in his grace, in his kindness and love, one of the greatest, greatest gifts he has given us is this book. And I just wonder if as Christians we thank God often enough for the beauty, the profound privilege of having this precious deposit of God's word, this permanent record. We talked about God's covenant last time, as I said, and the Bible is God's covenant constitution. So we can see the 
connection between the covenant and the, the word of God is that this is uh, his constitution to govern his covenant people. So I want us to note, first of all, that it's the nature of God to speak. If, in a sense, God is a tri-personality, Trinitarian in nature, then speaking, or the speaking God, that is a necessary attribute of God. Now, those of you who have studied theology before, perhaps have never heard that as an attribute of God. Um, we talk about God's holiness, His justice, um, His omnipotence, and so forth as attributes. Maybe you never heard of the fact His uh, speaking as being an attribute, but it is just as much um, as Trinity is is essential to His being as anything else is the fact that he is a speaking God. In fact, it is one of the most defining attributes of the true God is the fact that he is he speaks to us, whereas the idols, as we're told in Psalms and Isaiah, are dumb. They cannot speak. And even the other uh, false monotheistic religions like Judaism and Islam don't speak in the same way because they're not intertrinitarian or interpersonal. Uh, they're uh, strictly monotheistic. And in a sense, they had to create because there was no one else to talk to. Um, God was never lonely because he has been a trinity and had communication with himself. And see, that's the beauty of it because you think about the fact that the Father, from all I mean, he's super temporal, but we have to, as humans, we have to talk about like backwards eternity. You have the Father communicating with the Son, and the Father communicating with the Holy Spirit, or the Father communicating with both of them at the same time. Then you have the Son communicating with the Father, or the Son communicating with the Spirit, or the Son communicating with both of them. Or you have the Holy Spirit talking to the Father, or the Holy Spirit talking to the Son, or the Holy Spirit talking to both of them. You have all this dynamic, this beautiful, infinite dynamic of the, the Trinity, um, the interpersonal communication or the Word of God spoken within the Trinity for backwards eternity. And that is the foundation for the meaningfulness of our communication. Being made in God's image, we are communicators as well. Um, I just find it fascinating but beautiful and mind-blowing to think of the Trinity and, again, the dynamics of him as a communicator and as a speaking God. And that is a necessary attribute of um, the living God is that he is the speaking God, and so it only makes sense that he would speak to us as his image bearers through the various forms of the Word of God. And um, you know, you've heard the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, you can also turn that around that a word is worth a thousand pictures um, or a group of words because of, and we'll talk about the necessity of scripture more um, later in the later segment when we talk about the attributes of, of God's word. But think about the cross, the resurrection, those essential events in redemptive history. If we didn't have the Word of God explaining what they were, we wouldn't know the significance of the cross or the resurrection. So yeah, there's a there's a flip sense in which you know we talk about again a picture is worth a thousand words. Where when it comes to the Word of God, sometimes a word or a group of words can be worth a thousand pictures or events. 
because one sentence in the book of Galatians about the nature of the cross um, brings incredible content to understanding of the, what the cross in the resurrection means. Okay, now we're going to follow the same um, lordship attributes and applying it to his word because it is him. It's divine. God's word is divine. If you turn to Genesis 1 1, we'll notice, first of all, and I struggle with how to, how to present the, my introduction to God's word because there's so many different ways of doing it. Because, you know, again, sola scriptura uh, in the Reformation was, it wasn't the material cause, it was known as the formal cause of the Reformation. Uh, and as we'll see, it's from scripture that we get everything, um, all our knowledge about God and about redemption comes from God's word. And again, that's one of the, one of the battle cries of the Reformation, which we need to recover is sola scriptura and because that's being it needs to be recaptured as much today uh, as it was back then because in various subtle and not so subtle ways the the truth and the beauty of sola scriptura is being challenged uh, in in various ways and in various circles within christianity but we know, first of all, as with the Lordship attributes of, of God, that God's word has sovereignty or power to it. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, look at all the times where it says, and God said, and God said, or, he spoke verse 3 and God said let there be light verse 6 and God said let there be the expanse in the midst of the waters verse 9 and God said let the waters team verse 11 and God said verse 14 and God said let there be lights verse 20 and God said let the waters swarm verse 24 and God said let the earth bring forth living creatures that's the word of God speaking and um, creating by his omnipotent power of the word of God speaking creating out of nothing that's the sovereign power of the word of God the Trinity speaking um, so therefore we see very clearly the power of, uh, of God's word and uh, I think of the, the classic verse in Isaiah chapter 55. Hopefully I've got that marked somewhere. Isaiah 55, 11. That, um, yes, where it talks that God's word not only um, predicts the future, but it creates the future. Starting at verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word is living and active and all powerful. You know, think of Hebrews 4. But it always does something. When God's word is read out loud or personally, it always does something to you, uh, either good or bad. And that's why. It is, you must never, ever read God's word in a kind of a trivial, detached manner. Because God's word is holy and it's all powerful. And when we read it, it 
will have some impact on us, either for good or for ill, depending upon our attitude towards it. And with people who hear God's word, it will either save them or harden them, according to God's sovereignty. But let that be a cautionary um, note to you as far as um, how we listen to um, and uh, respond to the fact that God's word is all powerful. All right, flowing from the fact that God's word is all powerful is that it also has authority, all authority. And it has the ability to impose absolute obligation. I'll say it again. God's word, as coming from God himself, has the ability to impose not just at obligation, but absolute obligation. If it tells us information, it obligates us to believe it. If it gives us a command, we are obligated to obey it. If it gives us a, a comforting word, we are obligated to embrace that. If it gives us a, a note of hope, we are obligated to embrace that as well, and so on, depending upon the purpose of the particular word of God. We are to um, not mess around with God's word, but to obey it. God is the only one who, in his word, is the only one that can um, bind our conscience. There's no human authority that can do that, but God can. And we note in Genesis, we noted in Genesis 1, the power of God's authority, but we also can see his authority in the fact that, um, if you look back at Genesis 1, that he um, evaluates his own creation as being good, 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 and very good. And he names things, which is a sign of authority, as you may know. And then he gives that same authority to his image bearer, Adam, to name creatures. And just as an aside, no extra charge, you'll notice that when Adam does taxonomize or name things, it's always in the natural realm and never in the paranormal realm, which should teach us something about staying away from it and not being fixated on, uh, fixated on trying to taxonomize a realm that we have no business in messing with. That's something I have learned. So if you let's turn to the classic text and speaking about the authority of God's word, we can't we have to look at Second Timothy chapter three um, verses um, 15 and following. Um, Paul, it's a touching verse. You have to remember, Paul is, is, is dying, or he knows he's about to die. And so 2 Timothy, the context for this verse is a man, my hero, and for many of you too, uh, the greatest Christian who ever lived. Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was a Christ of the Christians. The definition of Christian is one who needs a, a savior. But here you have the greatest Christian who ever lived, and he's he knows he's about to die, and um, have his head locked off. So he is very concerned about the welfare of the church after he leaves. And, it's interesting that um, it's in that context that he gives us the, cl the clearest, or most profound statement of Scripture uh, in all of his writings. Uh, starting at verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out, Theonustus, by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness 
that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. All scripture, Pontus, Graphites, all scripture, and he's thinking primarily the Old Testament, but in anticipatory of the New Testament, breathed out by God. That's an incredible picture, but it is consistent with their understanding of the Word of God, God speaking at creation, bringing something out of nothing, and the same words that spoke creation into being is what we read when we read scripture. The Word of God is the Word of God. It's divine. Um, the medium of scripture is not divine, but the Word of God is divine. Uh, what I mean by the medium is the, the, the Bible, the book itself. We don't worship the, the Bible. But the Word of God, when we hear it read or read it, it is God's voice speaking to us. It was, uh, I say this reverently, but of Jesus himself, Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, walked into my living room right now and started speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It would not have more authority than reading God's Word. Or vice versa, reading the reading of God's word has the um, same authority as if God himself walked into the room. This is God's word. It's breathed out of his holy mouth. And for that reason, it has complete authority over us and impose absolute obligation. This has to be recaptured because the if you look at, at the statistics of what is said about the number of people who claim to be Christian, which is very high, according to the statistics that we're in the greatest uh, revival in the history of the church, <laughs> but is having no impact on our culture, nor on the people, most of the people who claim to be Christians. It doesn't have any difference in, in their sexual ethics or otherwise, for many of them, if not most. And that's where the authority of God's word needs to, we need to recognize it, him. Now, of course, when we talk about Scripture being um, breathed out by God, that has to imply the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible. If God is breathing and all of Scripture is breathed out by God or inspired, then we know that the God of truth is not going to inspire error. That's just a monstrous notion. Uh, the Bible is two things. It is infallible, which means that it's a stronger term, which means that it cannot err, but it's also inerrant, which means it does not err uh, in the autographs. And the Bible we have today um, is 99.99999% uh, is um, equivalent to the autographs, the originals. So it is um, infallible and inerrant, and uh, its authority and its nature. You may have heard the phrase, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, I think that that's interjecting a, um, an unnecessary and unhelpful um, subjectiveness to the authority. Uh, there, that middle phrase, I believe it. Um, what we really should say is that God said it, that settles it, and I believe it. Um, because we don't want to 
make any kind of middle ground of our belief in Scripture as if that um, adds to the uh, the authority of Scripture. God said it. That settles it. Then we should believe it because of that. I don't think that's just quibbling over words either. Okay. And then lastly, uh, we got the all-powerful nature of God's Word. We have the authority of God's Word. It has the ability and the right to impose absolute obligation on us. Oh, in the, let me just say another word about that. When it talks about uh, the authority, look at some of the things that it says in Timothy with reference to its authority. It says that it's profitable for, for teaching us. So what it teaches us about God and man, we are to believe. It's profitable for reproof or for correction. So if our behavior is out of line, then we need to bring it in line with Scripture. And it's profitable for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Um, what, like, one of the attributes of Scripture is its sufficiency, and that's clearly uh, displayed in this text here. But we that's so important, the sufficiency of Scripture, that we'll deal with that in a later segment. But just wanted to mention that in passing, that in this text here, when we're speaking of the authority of Scripture, it covers all the bases as far as... Um, it has the authority to um, inform us as to everything uh, is our foundation for all of our knowledge. Uh, our epistemology should be grounded in the Word of God. And that's just a big word for our source of knowledge. Epistemology that branch is that branch of philosophy that deals with the nature and the limits limits of knowledge or how we know what we know and it's it's God's um, in his kindness and love God has spoken to us and if he hadn't spoken to us then we'd be in a world of hurt because we wouldn't know a thing about a thing um, but because he has spoken to us then we know lots of things about many things and the most important things and most importantly we know the drama of redemption the means of salvation we know who God is we know who we are and um, how to have a relationship with him yeah the power you have the authority then lastly God's word brings his personal presence. God's word is his presence. God's word is God himself. Um, John 1, the gospel says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, pros, face to face, and the word was God. Or is God too. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So, um, where God is, his word is. And where the Word of God is, God is. It's really as simple as that. I alluded to this earlier, but when we read the Word of God, we are 
interacting with the presence of God himself. Um, we are, when we, when we read the inscripturated word, we are encountering the incarnate word personally. It's not just words on a paper. Um, according to that text, um, there's a doctrine of inspiration, which can be simply um, defined as there's an identification between the human authors and the primary author is uh, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as a primary author, his writing, his authority is uh, in presence, was, was identified with that of the human authors. So God superintended the human writers in such a way that this book right here is the Word of God. It doesn't contain the Word of God. It is, as in a neo-Orthodox way, it is the Word of God. So that when we read it, the very presence of God is with us. And the Word of God, where the Word of God is, God is present, personally present with us. You may not feel, you know, every time you read the Bible, um, chills or anything like that, but thankfully God's presence is much more real than just our feelings. But that is, I just will summarize it again, is that God's Word is God Himself. And hopefully we've shown that uh, enough that in our talking about uh, the, the nature of the Word of God, that um, it is God Himself, and that the speech of God um, within the Trinity, or His speaking to us as His image bearers, that when He speaks to us, particularly through his, his word, that it's, um, it's not just a textbook. It is an encounter with his presence. So when you read the Bible tomorrow or tonight, remember, as I said in our first time together, remember to look for God's power, sovereignty, his authority, and his presence. Now, those words might, may not be there, but look for the substance of them. Because if a command is given, then obviously that means authority or that's, that sort of thing. But what is often um, implied, but very real and, and, and perhaps most precious, is the fact that the Word of God means His, His presence with us. And I know that it's difficult for us as human beings that God is hidden from our eyes, but he's hidden for a reason. Um, and his hiddenness is a blessing to us because if we were to see him in our current condition, we would die. And um, But the beautiful thing is that when we read his word, it is as if Jesus was standing right in front of us, speaking to us. Um, I like to use that analogy because people say, well, if, if God came to me and spoke, then I would believe it. You've got it right here. His presence, the Word of God. And I'll say it again. Um, the way Jesus himself said it is uh, when he predicted the writings of the New Testament and the way he looked at the Old Testament uh, was that when we read it, we are encountering God himself in all his glory. 
you know, his um, sovereign power, all his authority, and his blessed, precious presence. And next time we'll look at some of the attributes of Scripture. So, thank you.